So what's the worst that could happen to me if I tell this truth? Unlike women in other countries, our break in silence is unlikely to have us jailed, disappeared or run off the road at night. Our speaking out will irritate some people, get us called bitchy or hypersensitive and disrupt some, and disrupt some dinner parties. And then our speaking out will permit other women to speak. Until laws are changed and lives are saved and the world is forever altered. Those are the words of a heroine of mine, um, Audre Lorde, a poet. And sometimes I think that that's how I approach the world, by thinking, what's the worst that can happen? A bit of mental, emotional, spiritual scenario planning, and then I crack on. But I wasn't always like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you how I found my voice in five chapters. Chapter one leave. I'd always considered myself to be an armchair activist and an armchair feminist. I'd, I'd see injustice and never thought that my voice could make a difference. And that maybe actually somewhere deep down, I probably felt that I didn't actually deserve that. I didn't believe that I deserved to be seen or heard because we've all got memories of things that have impacted us. And sometimes some are better than others, some are happier than others, but they all have a lasting impact. And it wasn't, it definitely wasn't an overnight transformation for me. I'm 49, just turned, and I am still changing. But wisdom and age and hindsight has taught me a few things. For a long time, there was a real marked difference between who I was presenting on the outside and who I really was on the inside. And I tried to fit in. I tried not, I didn't raise my head above water. I didn't ask probing questions. I felt that I was happier behind the scenes, making everybody else's vision and mission and ambition come to life. Because the way that I felt was that, well, if I'm in service to other, other people and to this bigger idea, then that would make me happy because some point, somebody somewhere at some point would recognize my contribution and they would celebrate it. And I would be paid and valued in all of those things. But I realized that I'd been putting too much pressure on myself to conform and it was making me unhappy. And I was constantly exhausted from trying to keep all these different identities and personalities separate. And I didn't know what kind of person I was. I didn't know what kind of wife I should be or what kind of lover I should be. And I realized that I was compromising my values and that I needed to stop making myself small and waiting for other people to really see me and actually become an unapologetic version of myself. So Skin, the lead singer from Skunk and Anxi, talks about the fact that she became more herself when she cut off her hair. She refused to conform and she refused to match the perception of people who, who people thought she was. So I chose to change my narrative and I, especially around how I was allowing other people to perceive me. So you wouldn't believe it now, but I used to have bright red shoulder length dreadlocks for about 14 years. And then after a divorce, cut them off. And then I went short, short Afro, and I had magenta pink buzz cut, and I was known for my hair. But a few years later, I became perimenopausal and it had a different idea for what, I, what was going to happen with my hair. And so I was like, yeah, I can deal with this. My hair's thinning, there's a little few patches. I can deal with that until I had random strangers coming up to me and saying, oh, you've got really, your hair is really thin and you should try this product. And so I decided I'm going to take back control and I'm going to shave my head, shave the lot off. And as this singer, India Irie sang, I am not my hair, I am not my skin, I am the soul within. So, chapter two, breathe. In February 1991, I had an ovarian cyst that ruptured and it took out my left ovary and my fallopian tube. And whilst I was in recovery, my aunt sent me a ticket to fly to New York to go and spend some time with some family. However, on the first day I arrived, I ended up a front seat passenger in a serious car accident that left me with most of my internal organs damaged. I had amnesia and I couldn't recognize my family. I look exactly like my mum, and I still couldn't recognize her. I couldn't walk, I couldn't think, I couldn't remember most of my past. Uh, I'd been accepted into university to study biochemistry and all of that knowledge had gone. Um, I eventually did go to university. I studied pure and applied maths and, ed and with educational studies, but I had to start again. And I realized that 
I had to rebuild myself, rebuild my identity, my relationship with the gaps in my memory. And it was an opportunity to reinvent myself. And it took years to get better and my memory is still crap, but I have created my own hacks in ways of being able to remember information, but I had great support because I couldn't do it alone and I had family and friends. But those who knew me and knew about that chapter in my life kept referring to me as this strong black woman because apparently nothing could keep me down, or so they thought. But, um, and this is really recent, I read um, something online that really struck a chord with me. And it was that fierce independence also masks trauma. And I didn't realize at the time that I had been masking trauma because I be became fiercely independent. My abusive ex-partner and my abusive ex-husband did recognize that as trauma and they latched onto it. And the fact that I was masking those traumas with, with the idea or the perception of strength, they started to chip away at that. And eventually for the second time, I lost my identity. But this time it was to abusive relationships. And I'm not gonna go into the details of my marriage, but after years of battles, I divorced my ex-husband and I threw myself into work. Um, and I became uber productive. I was promoted really quickly. I, um, I went to loads of swanky events. I was all speaking at loads of events, lots of um, running around, busy, busy, busy. But deep down, I realized that something was wrong and I'd lost my identity again because I was avoiding being with myself and really being honest about who I am. And on the outside, again, people saw this strong black woman, but what they didn't see was what was happening on the inside. And they saw me as fearless without actually truly understanding, having an empathetic understanding of what was going on, what it means to have to keep showing up or to choose to keep showing up to be and to say and to think and to do and to be your best, especially in spaces where you feel psychologically unsafe, especially because being a woman, but also being a black woman. And hindsight's a wonderful thing. And I now realize that I had also had to take responsibility for being able to breathe and for the narrative that I was allowing other people to put on me. And this meant I had to go back to understanding what my values are. So what are my values? Trust, reciprocity without ego. I mean, we've all got egos. I'm not Buddha. We've all got egos. The second one, curiosity, learning and growth through play. We have, a lot of us have had that curiosity kind of educated out of us. And for me, it was always important to be curious, to be curious about life and people and everything. Activism, empathetic and compassionate evolution. That activism isn't always about going on protest marches. It's about believing in something bigger than yourself and knowing what or having an idea what good or great looks or feels like and recognizing that you found your voice and you're trying to amplify those of others. Diversity, innovation through difference and collective intelligence. So in order to solve problems, we have to widen the diversity. To me, diversity is a given fact. We would not exist, our bodies would not exist without diversity and everything else is a choice. Humility, and this is mentioned previously, humility, strength and leadership through vulnerability. And so I still actively reject the stereotype and the narrative of the strong black woman because I'm more than the sum of what people think of me. Yes, I'm strong. Yes, I can also be vulnerable. I can be gentle, I can be wild, I can be fierce. And I've had amazing opportunities. And I've flown around the world and spoken at great big conferences. And I've been an artist at the Tate Modern and I'm now the chair of Mental Health First Aid, and I could reel off my CV, but that's not going to convey what's who I really am inside. And, you know, as we say at Mental Health First Aid, I'm bringing my whole self to everything that I do. So, chapter three, grow. People sometimes ask me, what's my purpose and what keeps me going? And it's a question I actually find really difficult to answer because I usually come up with something like human potential, which is true, but what's my deeper purpose is to be true to myself, my ethics and my values, to be unapologetically me, not uncompromising, but true to me and always start by being true to myself and present for myself first, because nobody else is gonna do it as well as we can. And to know that I can't do it alone, that it takes a relative amount of courage, knowledge, wisdom and insights and, and 
the lived experiences of others, especially other women who don't look like me, whose lives don't represent mine. And not always to focus on the glass ceiling, but on how I can contribute to creating levels of stability when the floor is constantly moving, not just for myself, but for others. And to lean into those differences and to look for the similarities as, as a starting point for transformation. So this year I was asked to write a manifesto for women as part of a big project um, with Sony Music and Broccoli Content. And it was launched uh, on International Women's Day on the 8th of March. And I started by asking this, how do you create a manifesto, a rallying cry and a movement that is truly inclusive of the beautiful diversity of the identities, cultures, experiences, knowledge and wisdom of women? I call myself a feminist, but in this time of increasingly digital, technological and algorithmic enlightenment, the word doesn't quite feel right because I'm privileged and I choose to recognize and acknowledge my privilege as a woman living in a so-called developed world. I choose to find out more and be empathetic, compassionate and inclusive in my existence of the lives and thoughts of experiences of other women. Culture to me is a manifestation of our collective identities and stories and values. And so our purpose is a measure of our success, of our success, of not anybody else's, because I think sometimes that's part of the problem as well, that we're measuring us, we're creating these value measures of success that are based on other people. And that society tends, the media tends to package it up and present us with these, in these groups and recognize and create these hierarchies of this is better than this, but they're not, they're just different. They're equal, but they're different. And ultimately all of us are just trying to do the same thing. To have a relationship and understand ourselves, to have a relationship and connect with others and to interact with our environment. And so this kind of realization led me to really make a conscious choice to immerse myself in other communities and experiences that and ecosystems that are outside of my echo chamber. So over the last week, I have had the honor of being facilitator of the Council of 90, a gathering of indigenous leaders from around the world whose aims were to create a global indigenous lobbying group and a manifesto for change. And it's been an honor to be invited and welcomed and accepted into that space. And I just immersed myself because I wanted to learn from the knowledge and the wisdom of others, of my ancestors, who are constantly fearless in ways that I would never even be able to begin to comprehend. And to hear people, and especially women, talk about the fact that some of their communities are on the brink of extinction through colonialism and the impact of capitalism and climate change. And yet they are the richest communities in terms of knowledge and wisdom and resources. And to hear them talk about their fight to get an education, to better their lives and the, their families' lives, and to be recognized by society, you know, for me, that's fearless. It's why I choose to embody the role of an activist. I believe in something bigger than myself. I know what an alternative could look and feel like. I know that I can use my voice and my platform to amplify the voices and experiences and the messages of others, and especially those that don't reflect my own life. And that by recognizing this and being clear about my values, I know that I'm being unapologetically myself. And that for some that will seem fearless, but I don't now, now I don't know any other way to be. And so I choose to be really conscious about the ripples that I'm creating in the world and those that came before me. So chapter four, flow. And you're probably asking yourselves, what, yeah, but what does she actually do? How does she get paid? How does this help her? How does she make money? So I've emerged as a transdisciplinary storyteller, a futurist, a cultural strategist, an artist, an activist. And yes, they're more labels, but that's not what is important. What's important is that I embrace my values, trust, curiosity, activism, diversity and, hum and humility. And I use them to be unapologetically myself. And that becomes my barometer for making decisions about anything. And so if that's what fearlessness is, then okay, yes, I am fearless. Um, but I just choose to do what feels right. Uh, I present as an extrovert, but I'm more introverted. I usually suffer from acute stage fright, even through Zoom. Um, and sometimes it's so bad that it feels like I have food poisoning. I'm shy, I'm socially awkward, I suffer from the imposter syndrome, 
Uh, my hands shake, they're shaking right now. Uh, my top lip sweats, I have palpitations and yet I still push through because I now know for me that that's the only way that I can be. If I'm gonna be honest with myself about who I am, then this is what I need to do. And so chapter five, ground. What does citizenship look like? What does kinship look like? What does it feel like? So my father's Nigerian Igbo, my mother is Guyanese Amerindian, and I was born in London, Southeast London, you can probably tell by the accent. But the Nigerian Igbo tribe have this concept called Mbari, where art is seen as a form of citizenship, where there's no one individual artist that you, but there's a community, you come together to be storytellers, whatever the medium takes. And so you could, it's your, it's, it's your duty. And so it doesn't matter whether you perceive yourself to be a good artist or a bad artist, part of your citizenship, your kinship is to be that artist, is to be part of that bigger thing to draw on the, you know, to, to know that this is what you need to do. Um, to, to not bring the, the ego at the very forefront of things and to have those voices the same, well, how dare you and why you? And so I'm gonna close as I started with the words of the poet, activist, feminist, Audre Lorde, who said, next time, ask what's the worst that can happen then push yourself a little further than you dare. Once you start to speak, people will yell at you. They'll interrupt you, they'll put you down, they'll suggest it's personal and the world won't end. And the speaking will get easier and easier and you will find that you've fallen in love with your own vision, which you may never have realized. And at last, you'll know that with surpassing certainty that the only one thing that is more frightening than speaking your truth is not speaking at all. Thank you.